Steve Williams. Uh, Christopher. Joseph. Steve Madeline. Kobe. John Fisher. Logan. Chandler. Uh, Julie. Christopher. Oh. Eh. Logan Loftus. Amber, Madison Redmond, Madison, Miller, mm -hmm. yep, uh, David, Lucas. Mason, Jason, no, I didn't finish your test yet. Hey, okay. um, I probably would have got it done, but I got hung up trying to uh, see if one particular person's answer was the same as the on the, on the answer key with some trade identity stuff because they did it differently. And I spent probably about an hour just trying to figure that out. Because you know, a math geek's mind sometimes gets stuck in math mode and wants to know something. So um, I wasted a whole lot of time doing that. So anyway, um, so they're fairly close to being done. So I'll definitely have them done this evening and post it on on uh, web design stuff like that. Um, so the. Uh, The tests are very um, bipolar, I guess. Uh, people either seem to be doing really well so far or not. There's not been a whole lot of in-between, okay? Um, so I'm kind of thinking about this a bit. Um, being able to do the integration is just uh, a very key part for the whole rest of the class, okay? Um, it's really going to suck if you don't know this stuff because that's really going to have a pretty negative impact on the rest of the class, right? Um, so typically, uh, I always give the, the test back and then 
you can make corrections to it and get a few of the points back. I think I might do something a little bit different, just give it a shot. Um, and for those of you who do really poorly, uh, then I think I'll let you retake the test. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but there will be a couple of conditions on it. Okay. Um, one, it's got to be done outside of class. You have to meet me in my office somewhere or another. Okay. Um, two, I'm going to require you to sit down with me either in person or over Zoom and go over the test. Okay. Um, and your maximum score on the retake is going to be a 90. Okay. Uh, I think the people who did it very well the first time deserve the A. You have to have retakes. I'm not sure. I think it's fair to give you the same score, right? So it's going to be topped out at uh, a 90 percent, which is still a damn sight better than what some people are looking at. Okay. Um, so I think we'll go that route because I really want you to make sure that you know how to do this crap and not punish yourself, you know, for the rest of the semester trying to relearn it and all the rest of it now. So I think maybe we'll do something like that if you're interested in doing it. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think it was just a lot tougher than some of you anticipated. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out from there, but when I get the test, we can talk about it more uh, individually if you want to do something like that on Thursday or whatever, we can make try to make some arrangements and stuff. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, we were doing the uh, solid resolution stuff and finding the volumes using the uh, disk method, right? So I'm going to do kind of one more of those and then we're going to talk about the cylindrical shells and see if we can get those suckers set up um, and give you kind of an, an alternative way to do it. All right, so we've got this. We're going to revolve this shape. Let's just say it's the part that's enclosed by uh, these two graphs. And we're going to rotate it about the line y equals 1. <laughs> Let's see, x cubed. That's going to look something like this. And then we have the square root of x. And that's this number. So all I want to rotate this time is the part that's in between those two graphs. Okay. And then we're going to rotate that sucker about the line y equals 1. So this would be our axis of revolution here. Of course, these two things intersect at the point on one. So just do, you know, x equals square root of x. So our little rectangle would go in between those two. All right, because so we want to set it at perpendicular to axis of revolution. So that means we're going to integrate with respect to x. That's the, the little width of my, my little rectangle, right? So thinking about this desk, disk that spins around, it's got that hole in it again. Okay. What is the radius for that sucker? Remember, what we've got is we've got this little disk. All right, so we want the outer one minus the inner one, right? And then we just have to subtract those two, okay? So the outer radius. Right? 
Yeah, it's going to go all the way down to that x cube. So it's going to be 1 minus the x cube. Remember, it's 1 minus the y coordinate, right? That little radius, that thing is going up and down. But the y coordinate in terms of x is the x cubed. So it's going to be 1 minus the x cubed. Then the inside radius would be the part that we're taking out. That would be this part in here. And that would be 1 minus the rate of x. And then the x coordinates, well, we just want to look at the two intersection points. So I know this intersection point down here, both of those suckers intersect at the origin. And then they intersect at the point one, one. So we're doing the x coordinates. So that goes from zero to one in both those cases. That set up okay? So just multiplying those things out. Now we can apply our uh, just little basic power rule type thing. Just to be lazy, I'm going to factor the pi out and I'll worry about it later. So that's going to be what x minus 2 half x to the fourth plus one seventh x to the seventh and evaluate it as zero and one minus then x minus let's see that would be x to the one half right so we add one that would be three halves so we'll have four thirds in the front because we've got to divide by the three halves we'll multiply by the for the reciprocal there, so that'd be four thirds. Plus one half x squared, all that times pi. So evaluating at one and zero is nice and easy, right? Kind of like those examples. Take you a half plus a seventh, so that'd be seven, eight, nine, fourteenths. And here we'll have negative one third plus a half. That would be negative two plus, so that'd be a sixth. That's negative two plus over six, yep, so that's one six. And then nine fourteenths plus a six, so <clears throat> so that'd be 10 over 21 pi when it's all said and done, I think.
चलो फिर क्वेश्चन सामने से डाल देते हैं इसे Okay, so there's our disk method, right? In each of these cases, the important thing to kind of really remember when trying to set things up is that your little representative rectangle is perpendicular to the axis of revolution. Okay. Now the other option is this cylindrical shells method. Okay, so on the cylindrical shell method, just to kind of give a, a picture here. Whatever shape we have, I say we're gonna rotate it about that's something. This has nothing to do with the problem I have written up there. I'm just kind of giving a picture of what's kind of going on. So let's say this is our axis of revolution. Okay. And we have something that we want to rotate about that. Okay. What we're going to do is we are going to set up our rectangles so that way they are parallel to that axis. And then when you rotate that sucker around, okay, each of these little shapes give you this kind of cylinder, all right, if you think about it. <clears throat> the next little rectangle Let's say we just work our way inside or whatever, would we'll fit, you know, right inside that. It would give you this little piece. And we'd have another one on the inside of that, right? That we would have to add to it until we fill in that whole little piece. Okay? So it's like we're taking a bunch of soda cans and we're stuffing slightly smaller cans inside of it. And we continue that until it fills up. That makes sense? All right, so what's the volume of this particular shape then? So if you look at one of those layers, okay, because when we did the disk method, we looked at the area of the base times the height, and the height was the, the dx thing, right? So it was just the volume of a, of a cylinder. Okay. This is a little bit different because that cylinder that we're creating when we rotated around isn't solid. So how do we find the volume of just one layer of that? We don't want the surface area. All right, we want the volume of it. So if you look at that one little shape here, I'm going to erase, erase this so we have it in, without all the extra stuff. So if we look at the, outside of this is kind of, what it looks like, right? Now, imagine for a second slicing that right down one side of it and then unrolling it. All you have is that shape. Just a big rectangular prism. Now, the width of this thing is the delta x, right? That's how thick it is. Okay. 
because that's determined by that little rectangle that we're spinning around. What is the height of this thing determined by in the picture that I had drawn? So that I, I thoughtfully erased because we had something like that, right? And I said, whatever our function is, and our little rectangle was right here. So the height of that box that I have is just whatever the function is. Make sense so far? What's the length? The length is nothing more than the circumference of that circle. Right, remember, we're cutting over unrolling it, right? So the length is this part that goes all the way around to the bottom from the point that we cut it and we unroll. So it's the circumference of that circle. And so how do you find circumference of a circle? Is two pi r, right? So what's the radius of that circle? It's from the axis of revolution to that rectangle, right? Now, if the axis of revolution were at the y-axis, that would just be the x-coordinate for it. How far you go out, right? But if our axis of revolution is somewhere else, let's just say x sub i, then the radius would be whatever that x-coordinate is minus the x sub i. Because we just want the radius for that, right? That makes sense? So then the volume would be 2 times pi times whatever that radius is times the height times the delta x. And then we have to add all of those things up, right? So the, the volume that we really want, the volume for, let's say, each little slice. So the volume for the total, 2 pi. Would be that. 2 pi times the radius times the height of the function. So it's just the circumference of the circle times the height. Now, if we flip it on its side, it's the same thing, but we're in terms of y's instead of x's, correct? Okay. So whether we stand it vertical or we stand it laid on its side, it doesn't really change this much. But all we're doing here, even though the shape looks like some kind of cylinder, all we're doing is finding the volume of the box. That should be that the length of the box is the circumference of the circle. So it's 2 pi r. The height of the box is whatever the function is. That makes sense? What we're going to do here? All right, so let's just try a couple of examples. Again, I'll say if you are uh, a formula person, they give plenty of good little formulas that you can memorize for these things. Okay? Go for it. But no, no, I still maintain that if you're good at memorizing, it's a good way to do it because it is faster, especially when you go to take exams and things like that. Okay? Um, the way I do things is just a little bit slower, so it takes a bit more practice to get it up to speed fast enough that you can you know, perform it on a test and stuff. 
Okay, so. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to rotate this figure about the x-axis. And what we've got is the function x, y equals 1. x equals 0, y equals 1. So let's see, x equals 0 would be the y-axis. So I'm just going to kind of draw these things in. y equals 1, horizontal line, let's say through here. y equals 3, horizontal line a little higher than that. And x, y equals 1. What shape is that? What's that look like? Looks something like that. Do what? Yeah. Yep, just a funny white way of writing one over x, y one over x. Okay. So what we're looking at rotating then is this little area that's inside right in here, bound by all of those curves. And we're spinning that sucker around the x-axis. x equals 0, y equals 1, y equals 3, x-axis. All right, so now, one advantage of this, see the disk method, is I don't have to worry so much about this blank space that's in the middle, because we just stop adding in all of those little shells, okay? So we can integrate just from one to three, okay? Our rectangle should be facing this way. That's why I know I'm going from one to three. It's the y coordinates because I want it parallel to the axis of revolution. So I need things in terms of y because we're going to do a Delta Y thing here. So it's two times pi times whatever the radius is. So in this case, the radius, it's whatever that X coordinate is, because we're going from the axis out. So I have whatever the X coordinate is minus zero, right? Okay, so the X coordinate in terms of Y is one over Y. We just look at our equation up here and say, okay, well, let's just solve this thing so it's x equals. So there's our circumference. That's the bottom of the box, right? The height of the box is whatever that function is. Which would just be, I guess, y.
Well, if the radius is 1 over y, all right, and we're just using the, the equation, really, just using that, right? So if we know that the x is 1 over y, whatever x we choose, the y coordinate has to be the reciprocal of that. Right, so however far we go out, that x coordinate, I just say that right? Wait a minute. I wrote those backwards. This, this one should be y. And this one's 1 over y. Because the, the radius of the circle that we have is from here up to that rectangle. And that would be the y coordinate. So if the y coordinate is whatever it is, then the function is one over that, right? And that's the height of my little representative rectangle. Okay, because the x and the y components are just reciprocals. You think of it, you got to go out whatever the x coordinate is, which is the one over y. So that's where that one's coming from. Okay, that makes sense? Which is really nice because y times 1 over y is just 1. So we'll evaluate that from 1 to 3. So that would be 6 pi minus 2 pi. So our volume would be 4 pi. Are we okay with that? I always thought this one was a little bit harder to visualize, but algebraically, oftentimes it turns out to be a little easier because you don't have to worry about squaring binomials and stuff like that. Okay, this is just 2 pi r instead of a pi r squared. So I've also thought algebraically this was a little bit easier to do in many cases, but it was harder to set up because of the visual visualization that I kind of have to go through with the shells and stuff like that. Okay, so it's one of those has a, a trade off. All right, so let's say we want to try this one. We're going to go from y equals x cubed, y equals zero and x equals one, whatever shape is bound there. And we're going to spin that about the y equals one. All right, let's see. So y equals zero is the x axis. Y equals one up here is going to be our axis of revolution. That's what we're spinning around. And x equals 1. And then the y cubed. And that little spot would just kind of look like this would be just that piece of it. <clears throat> and so what we are spinning around then is the spot that's in between all of those, that little almost kind of triangular shape type thing. Yeah, 
in this one set up so our rectangle is going to go this way, perpendicular to that, or parallel to the axis of revolution there. So let's be careful, the radius then will be this piece. So that's going to be one minus whatever the y coordinate is, right? So the radius, let me just write these pieces down, it's going to be one minus whatever the y coordinate is. Now at that spot, the height of the rectangle is going to be what? I call it height, but I'm really thinking about the long ways part of it, right? Okay. So, because we know this piece is delta y. Okay. So, I'm calling from here to here the height. So, how long is that little piece? going to go from this line, right, over to that curve. So that would be just one minus whatever that x coordinate is, right? Look right. So it's one minus whatever the x coordinate is. Now. The x coordinate, though, since we're integrating with respect to y, we want that in terms of y. And if our equation on that curve is the you know, y equals x cubed, then the x coordinate will be the cube root of y. Which tells me then my height that I'll use is 1 minus cube root of y. So there's my 2 pi r, there's the length of my box, and I'll unroll this stuff, right? Times the height of the box, 1 minus e root of y, and that will give me the volume. Now I just have to decide on what my bounds are for my integral, and that box, if I stick it in that, is always going to go from, well, 0 to 1, where it intersects that axis up there. Well, 1 minus cube root of y is 1 minus x. Yeah. Right, which is the or length if, you, if you're looking at it, you know, this way. But I, I don't care whether I rotate it. I always call the width the dx or the dy, right? And then the height is the other dimension of it when I say the height, right? So the height is this way, which is just in between the 1 and the function. So the, the height of that would be 1 minus whatever this x coordinate is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see, so we multiply that out, we'll get 1 minus e root of y. I'm going to write that as y to the 1 third. Maybe y to the one third minus y minus and then y to the one third times y. You add exponents. That'd be y plus 
y to the four thirds. And that should have been a by. This is my power rule at this point. And we evaluated it in zero and one, blah, 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 blah. And we subtract the zero, you know, I mean, that's just zero, all right? Let's see, what do we got? We got one fourth minus. One and a half would be negative one four plus three sevenths, negative seven plus twelve over twenty eight. That's five over twenty eight. So I'm getting somewhere around like five, five, or fourteen. Okay, so wherever we set this little box up here, okay, wherever we set this thing, we're rotating about this dash line, right? Okay, so we've got to figure out how far away it is from that. Well, we, when we set it in a particular spot here, and what I think about is, in my mind, I'm thinking about like all of the little boxes, right? I'm going to have one here and here and here. We're moving them kind of vertically, right? So that tells me it's the y coordinate where the box is sitting. So if this is the y coordinate for that box, then the distance from where we're spinning it to that would be whatever that axis is minus the y quarter, which is one minus y. Yeah, because we're spinning it back. That makes sense? Same reason that the height here is one minus that, because we want the distance between this point and that graph, because that determined how high that box was. That would just be one minus y. It doesn't really matter for this. This part really doesn't matter what the function is. It's just where's the box sitting, and that's determined by the y coordinate. So it's always going to be one minus y. Now, if the axis of rotation were at y equals two, it would be two minus y. If the axis of rotation were at zero, it would just be y. Um, but we would be rotating about that, and uh, we could do other. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, it's just relative to where the axis is, it's always going to be the axis minus y, or if all the stuff is done with respect to x, it would be the axis minus x, or just the x coordinate kind of. So, I mean, if our axis of revolution were the x-axis, then from there to the box, it's literally just whatever the y-coordinate is. How far do you have to go up? So, in that case, it would just be y. Okay? But since the axis of rotation is kind of above that, we've got to figure out the distance between the axis of revolution and the box. That's what we're always looking for. What's the distance between that makes sense. Mm 
Any other questions on this one? And this one is so important, I apparently put it on there twice. All right, so we've got 4x minus x squared. Well, I'm just trying to get a, a decent little graph here. X equals zero and X equals four. Okay. And then Y equals three. And then what's the vertex? T. Okay, so there's a decent enough sketch of that. That y equals three. Be this line in here somewhere. All right. And we're going to spin that around x equals one. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what that's going to look like when you spin it around there? So it's kind of going to look like the top half of the donut, but if you squeeze it so there's no hole in the middle, but it still has the little lump on it, right? So if you just kind of shrunk up the donut a little bit so the just had like maybe a little pin prick of a hole in the middle, just cut the top off. And that's what that would wind up looking like. Somewhere around there. Okay. Now, so that's next thing. What about this little piece right in here? Now, that's inside of the shape, right? So it's not going to contribute anything to the volume because it's already inside. You can kind of imagine as this thing spins around, this piece stays on the inside of that shape. So it doesn't contribute anything at all. So we can ignore that little piece of it. So when I set this up then, I'm just going to wind up integrating with my rectangle this direction, okay? So that's going to be a, there's my little delta x. So I'm just going to start at one and end over here at four. Those are the only places I'm putting my little shells.
All right, so from the axis of rotation to the rectangle, that's my radius. It's always my axis of rotation to the rectangle. So what is my radius in this case? It's just going to be from here to here. This is determined by the x coordinate. So the distance from the x coordinate to 1 will be x minus 1. So my radius is just x minus 1. The height of this thing is just given by the y coordinate, right? Which is the function. So that's going to be the 4x minus x squared. So there's my interval. 2 pi r times the height times the or dx. Oh shit, no, I wasn't I, I would wasn't even looking at my green line anymore. Okay. Ah, so actually here. We do have to be a little bit more careful. There's in, in this spot, it only goes up to the three, okay? But over here is where it's limited by the function, okay? So I do need to then split that into these two pieces, one from here over, which is, starts where? What's that x coordinate? Yeah, so the 3 has to equal to 4x minus x squared, right? To find those intersection points. So x squared minus 4x plus 3. So that happens when x is 3 and 1. So that's when x equals 3. So we'll do this just between 3 and 4. And that'll give us that part of it. And now, the other piece then, we could do it one of two ways. We could go from 1 to 3 going to be 2 times pi times x minus 1, but the height is always going to be 3, because it's capped off of that, that green line. Or, when you spin all those things around, you're just making a cylinder in there. It has a flat top and a flat bottom, so you could go back to just geometry and go, oh, look, I've got a cylinder. It has a radius of two, because you're going from one to three. It has a height of three. And use your two pi RH formula for, for that. Okay. So that's, that's another option for, for doing that. If you know it's a very specific shape that you have a formula for from geometry and stuff, use it if you want. Not going to make a, a, a whole lot of difference. Okay. So this one, yeah, we had to split up into those two little pieces. Okay. Let's see what we got. 4x squared minus x cubed minus 4x plus x squared. Okay. 
got my little dx. We're just trying to simplify a little bit. And I could have combined my like terms. But now I'm too far along to go back and rewrite everything. Okay, so we'll evaluate that from three to four. Plus, I did not write down my two pi there. Oh, no, that's, I didn't know because I have it inside the radical still. Yeah. So we oh it's already in there. So three pi x squared evaluated from one to three. And we'll add those up. Yep. <clears throat> Wish you could do these things here as fractions and whatnot because that was 10 and two thirds. Um. <clears throat> I'm getting like 43.7 when I type everything, somewhere around there. <coughs> so what? Okay. which is different. <clears throat> of course, I could have typed something in wrong piece, but no. Um. That is ten and two thirds. Thank you. 
Just double checking things. <clears throat> That's nine and three, twenty seven. Yeah. Where now? Should have had the minus two pi. Yeah, see, there's always something. It's way up here, uh, minus two pi. Because I didn't distribute there. Okay. So let's see. I know, I know, I'm working on it. Hold on. <laughs> <clears throat> so that would be a six pi. And just fix that part. That'd be the minus six pi x, I weight that at one and three. And so at three, I have 27, 21 pi. And then at one, then make it a three pi. All right. No, I still, hold on, mental math went bad here. That's, that was 47 over 12. That's not the 12 pi. If I evaluate this thing at three, that's 27 pi minus 18 pi. All right. So 27 minus 18 on most days is somewhere around nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be nine pi minus, and then at one, that would be the negative three. So that would be plus 12 pi. And then let's see, so yeah, times two. I haven't distributed the two in there. So 47 over six, yep. And then I would add those things maybe back together to get one fraction out over to use a decimal, whatever. Start mm -hmm. arithmetic. All right, you okay?
I mean, those are all the examples I had now. Do we need to see any more examples? Are you good? More examples? Or, okay. So you can't just nod your head and say, it, it, it wasn't a yes or no thing. You're confusing me. But Emily said she was okay. I'm, I'm going to go with the thumbs up being, yeah, I'm okay. That was that one then? Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Um, all right, we'll call it a day then. And then on Thursday, We'll start off with a couple of problems where we're trying to choose which one of these two methods to use and stuff like that. So we can kind of figure out how to decide when to use what method. Okay. Because yesterday was strictly, here's a bunch of examples for this method. Here's a bunch of examples for this method today. Now it's, how do I know when to use what? Okay. So we'll spend a little bit of time on Thursday, just going back and forth between the two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, have a wonderful afternoon. Take care of yourselves.